the antidote. 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 You're listening to the antidote with Dave Hawkins. With Christian music that doesn't suck. I'm Dave Hawkins, and you've got the antidote. I've always made it known that I really enjoy a lot of different music styles, even those that may stretch the boundaries of what could be called typical music. There's always artists out there that want to climb out of the box and make something significantly different, and that's what's in store on this edition of the antidote. I met with a pair of artists who have completely different styles and who are both making an artistic statement with their music. At the half-hour point of the show, I'll speak with Zach Bradier of Captive Portal. For now, I meet with Curtis Bell, whose entire music catalog may only be eight minutes long, but it's guaranteed to shake you up. Enjoy. Curtis Bell of Osprey Shire, and I have been in touch by email, I guess, really for a couple of years. Yeah. Now we finally have a chance for a real talk. Thanks Definitely. for coming to The Antidote, Curtis. No problem, Dave. I'm sure you've been asked about the name Osprey Shire dozens of times. So what is it? You're meshing nature with Tolkien? Tolkien? Okay. Uh, I mean, don't get wrong. Like, respect to Tolkien, but that's actually not how I came up with uh, Shire or Shire, if you want to talk in a British accent over there. Um, not like that, though. I've been asked that multiple times. Um, the name itself, Osprey Shire, really isn't like some grand statement as some people might suspect or having some sort of subversive meaning, though. I've actually wanted to use the name Osprey in some sort of project for some time. I just didn't know which format or how I would use that. And I guess one could say I was just doing the whole Portlandia way by putting a bird on it. We put birds on things. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I'm sorry, I just had to use that reference right over there. Um, but I thought having Shire as a suffix, kind of like how you see a lot of stuff in the UK, where it's like Oxfordshire or Devonshire or Oxfordshire or Devonshire, if you really want to be technical with the pronunciation. I thought like it'd be interesting like combining those words together, like maybe it's like uh, a certain piece of land where I guess it would be equivalent to a county or a state. I, I do forget my... Um, comparisons over there too so it can kind of like a fiefdom or some sort of area it's just more like fun combining words than some grandiose statement or artistic meeting to be honest with you (laughs) (laughs) yeah maybe you should have just moved to england from illinois yeah maybe i mean i've wanted to visit the uk for the longest time though (laughs) (laughs) there all you've got to do is put on the wings of an osprey and you're ready to go Sure, I just want to reference that Driver 8 song, Sun Bitter, and yet 90s tooth and nail right over there. How the courses just fly away, <laughs> fly away, going fly away. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're off to a weird start, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can be a little bit off the cuff sometimes, not gonna lie. <laughs> I've got to tell you that you're probably the most unusual artist I've ever had on The Antidote. By being unusual, is that you or is it just your art? Um, I would guess it's a little bit of both. I mean, I will admit I'm pretty eccentric and I'm pretty much off the beaten path. Even like my friends and family will tell you that and stuff. But I feel as though with the art aspect of uh, Osprey Shire, I just really want to do something that I've never done creatively before. And and I know this is going to sound a little bit egotistical, but like maybe just do something more original. At the same time, I want to have some constraints on my creativity. With the first thing is not using guitars. I'm not sure if anyone's ever noticed that, though. But I want to use some instruments I've never used before. I mean, the Omnicore being a big one for a couple of tracks in the EP, for example. And I also wanted to try some irregular instruments. And also I wanted to go back to using acousmatics, like using found sound, but able to manipulate it in different ways where it sounds completely foreign and abstract from what the original source was. That sounds like it's more work than actually playing an instrument. Yeah, I can I can see the logic in that, too. I mean, musically, I'm actually not doing some super complex stuff, so don't expect any, like, Hope for the Dying guitar solos or anything like that. Shout out to my fellow Illinoisans right over there. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I feel as though 
musically, like just the actual notation is heavily influenced by minimalism and post minimalism where I'm not playing as many notes or like that many chords. So I just want to have like more of an atmosphere and not just because I want to make it oh simple to play. Cause I feel as though with some of the stuff I'm doing, especially with, uh, some of the stuff I've put in compilations or even like my Kata Uta 52 project to some simple chords or simple, um, leads but using atypical chords like maybe a uh, d7 sustain four or whatever but i'll throw in some like regular major minor chords or progressions from time to time i can feel a spark burning through the subterfuge i can feel a spark Burning through the subterfuge. Amplify anon. Emancipation starts. This emancipation starts. Your recordings are spoken word, but there really is an overlap between spoken word and poetry. So how do you consider yourself? Are you a poet or a spoken word artist? That's that's actually a really good question, though. I consider myself to be both, I probably would lean a little bit closer to the poet side of the fence, mainly because I feel like I've written more poems than I've actually performed or have spoken them out live, though. But even then, that's been changing. I've been writing lyrics and poems for a long time, but I feel like writing lyrics, I've probably done some since I was, I want to say, like 11, 12 years old, somewhere in that uh, time frame. But I feel as though more recently, I think, especially after like being at Cornerstone and seeing some artists there, like let's just say Listener, Chris Bernstorff, um, Me Without You, or even seeing a lot of spirit, like the, which I just the first basement show I've ever seen was that band when I saw them in Chicago, like back when I was in college. Um, and even getting to more uh, stuff like Gil Scott Heron, um, Saul Williams. I want to do something like that, but I don't want to just have my voice. I want to add different things too. I guess I start with the acousmatics and then I just added whatever instruments that I wanted to use in that too. So I'm just a poet that actually has a bit of a soundtrack to him, so to speak. <laughs> and how does that soundtrack change the presentation of the spoken word? I personally think it gives it a new dynamic. I mean, the lyrics can actually work by themselves and I've, actually tried that uh, when I was at a poetry reading at my hometown's uh, poetry club that we meet at the library, where I actually did the uh, reanimation review of number one that was on the, um, it was on the Grave Robber uh, compilation for uh, Wretched. It was that one, but except I did it, I guess for lack of a better term, I did it a cappella over there, and it was able to work just fine. But I feel like with a musical accompaniment, or at the very least with whatever soundscapes I can come up with, I feel like I can accentuate certain aspects of the emotion of the poem or even possibly like giving more of a shine to the words that I'm using or maybe the words can dictate what kind of a sound or what kind of a mood I am going for even if it's not obvious like at first or second listen. May this lyrics be a crossbow aiming and piercing barricades, shielding the glamorized undead. Reload, reanimate. and piercing barricades, shielding the glamorized undead. Reload, reanimate. May this larynx be a crossbow, aiming and piercing barricades, shielding the glamorized undead. Reload. Reanimate. 
You're going to have to help me out with something because I've never been able to sort out how to define spoken word. I mean, is this music, is it audio art, or is it poetry? Hmm. You know, I actually, I legitimately never thought of it that way. Um, it's funny because I feel like, I guess, me doing stuff in the studio, I guess it could be more audio art because I'm doing like all these studio manipulations. Um, and I guess I haven't performed the songs, these poems, if you will, as like just my voice, just acapella as much as I want to or or I could expect to. I feel like now that you, wow, you're really challenging my philosophy and how I do things. <laughs> no, and I really appreciate you asking that question. I can see so many defensible things about it being a form of audio art, like it's my take on poetry, adding a little bit of um, avant-garde stuff, acousmatics, uh, musique concrete, and like other movements of that nature. How do I revitalize a necrotized soul to control vitality down to each scintilla? As my back becomes a pincushion for fraudulent friends, ending amical bonds, I want to trust again. But it's hard to trust when one dons a carapace. I want to trust again. Something that does stand out about what you do is that it's also brief. I mean, oh, yeah. most of your pieces are less than a minute long. So you got to tell me, is Ospreyshire the Reader's Digest version of poetry? <laughs> <laughs> okay, hold on, hold on. Let me just, uh, okay, let me just get back together. Reader's Digest, wow. <laughs> that is an interesting way to put it, though. Um, I hope I'm you don't take to... that as being insulting. Oh, no, 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 not at all. Personally, I thought that question was funny, to be honest <laughs> with you. I personally don't think it's a Reader's Digest of poetry because there are forms of poetry that are intentionally very small. Just look at the haiku, for example, only three lines with a 575 five syllabic form. But then you have other stuff like how I've been doing the Kata Uta 52 project literally for the past year and I just finished it last week. Um, or even have like other shorter form, forms like uh, Tanka. You, you can probably tell I'm influenced by a lot of Japanese poetry at this point. But um, <laughs> or even Sinquain, um, Ryuka, or even just basic things like a Triquain or a Sinquain. But I guess the whole brevity aspect isn't just because of some freeform poems that just happen to not use as many words, or maybe I'm intentionally using a shorter structure or template of poetry. This is going to sound a little bit weird, though. I feel like it's a little bit of a punk aspect, too, how you have so many of those bands that John Adele play songs that are like 45 seconds, a minute, or two minutes. And I know not all bands like that, but I guess that kind of brevity affected how I did a lot of these recordings. I can never sort out that idea of you having a punk attitude. <laughs> I'm going to go on a limb here. You know how small guys compensate for their height by being aggressive? Can I guess that you're tall and that you're actually compensating by doing short poetry? You would actually guess right about that. <laughs> I'll even tell, I'll even put this on the record. I'm six foot two, by the way. You definitely tower above me. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I'm usually one of the taller people in the room, like most places I go. <laughs> <laughs> And is the short form of poetry compensating for that height? I never really thought of it that way, though. But there's also part of me that wants to write some 10 or 12 minute epic. <laughs> just kind of, I don't want to say match my height, but just kind of be something that's completely an inverted expectation if someone's used to like the stuff I've released so far. <laughs> then why not go for a longer story? I'm definitely open to that. I just don't know what that story would look like now. Hello there, everyone. This is Curtis from Ospreyshire, and you have the antidote with Dave Hawkins. My heart is a crater, as I've emptied out desires and past hobbies, purged in the shimmering fire of May. Yet, I still want things to seal this crevasse in my chest, but to no avail. Well, 
let's get into more of your stories. Your debut EP, Versus versus Anhedonia, came out just over a year ago. It's full of sad stories. Was that yes. what you intended to pull out? Um, yes, intentionally, I guess, which explains the second half of the title, the Anhedonia thing. Relax, I'm not diagnosed with that. But like with that word, I think before I came out with the um, EP, I found out about that word earlier that year, how it's a, a psychological state where someone experiences no pleasure, like no joy, whether they're in social situations or doing hobbies or something like that, too. And I was like, wow, this is actually pretty lacrimose if you really think about it. So, <laughs> And then I had these uh, poems, some of which I've actually had for a few years. But I realized that there was an overarching theme with some of them, too. And I also, I just had to be honest, I'm not someone who's going to be like, oh, happy, happy, joy, joy. Yeah, I can't believe I used a Red and Stimpy reference right there. But um, <laughs> uh, but just saying like, oh, I just, I'm just so happy. Nothing's wrong for me and stuff like that. Um, no, I'm, I'm not like that. If I'm going to be angry or depressed, like I'll tell you straight up about it, though. But at the same time, it's also a weakness of mine where I feel like I've internalized a lot of that um, sorrow and anger and stuff like that. I mean... Like, growing up in school, I felt like I wasn't allowed to be sad or wasn't allowed to be angry. Or even if I were to talk to someone, like, no one would um, really listen to me. And, yeah, I'm really sorry if this got, like, really, really, really sad, like, all, all of a sudden, though. But, like, it has been a lingering thing. And I felt like I needed a form of catharsis. And I just turned those poems into the stuff I put on the EP. So it was with my verses, poetic verses versus vs period whatever anhedonia or sadness that i felt the golden pretense to gild lives twisting chapters twisting truth for them to be the one the one true believer the one faithful the one anointed the one percent when the banner was made to provide the destitute there these sermons must collapse. Obviously, you're aware that the antidote gets into music from a Christian viewpoint. Mm -hmm. You also share about that on Osper Shire's Servile Fear, yes. Theophobia. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about the track? Yeah, of course, it's technically two poems. I just smushed it together into one track. <laughs> um, I guess with that combination of poems, it just started kind of like having this fear of God, but I feel like it was the wrong kind of fear, if that makes sense. Not like a fear as in, oh, you have to like respect and stuff like that. But for me, it was just like, it was like cowardice or felt that I had to be in pure, pure servile mode where I felt like I had to do this or do that or in fear that, let's say, God would be angry, which kind of like segues into the second part of that track, Theophobia, the fear, the irrational fear of God, like that fear that like he was going to punish me if I did something wrong or anytime I did something wrong, whether I did something bad or like get punished or something, I feel like, did I really deserve this? Like, am I that bad of a person or does he just not like me and stuff? Because I feel like I cannot make something that goes, oh, like, I feel like I love God like all the time. It's like, no, I feel as though I feel like I I've just been doing bad things. There have been some times where I feel like I've been doubtful and I feel like maybe just like he, he didn't love me. And I guess that that particular track kind of focused on some of those feelings that I had for the longest time. Now I'm a lot better about it, too. Don't get me wrong. But I it's still a work in process like that, though. I just had to be honest with some of the darker aspects of spirituality that I face for the longest time. So then you found your faith to be a struggle. Yes. And how do you pull out of that? It's a really good question. Um, I know I'm not going to, like, I have the, all the answers or anything, but I just know that there have been some positive things that have happened to me. There, and I will admit, there are some times I've definitely discounted that. Um, but things have been getting a lot, a lot better, especially since, like, at, at that point. It's that acceptance that bad things can and will happen to people, but... At the same time, I can't ignore any positivity, though. I have to have like a healthy sense of realism and take the good with the bad and vice versa. Yeah, well, I still have a lot to work on, 
though. But compared to where I was two years ago, five years ago, or ten years ago, I feel so I'm a lot better. But I'm definitely far from being <laughs> this perfect person. Like I'll even tell you straight up, I'm not some kind of a saint. <laughs> All I see is trouble with subconscious actions when I believe that everything I do is a vice. I've seen you as a judge, but I wanted you to be a father. I've seen you as a jury, but I wanted you to be a redeemer. I've seen you as an executioner, but I've wanted you to revive. I've seen others fall away. I do confess to have wandered as well. I don't want to put you to the test. All I want is for you to show that love is real. You do bring out a redemptive view on the closing track, Osteopathic Mutation. Purposeful. Yes, this was definitely the most purposeful and easily the most positive track on the album. I didn't want it to have like some super happy or a corny ending like something out of a disney movie though but i wanted to have a more realistic thing where there is hopefulness and while yes there is gonna be darkness to wherever i go i have to earn that happy ending to make sure that i am not a victim sure i have I been victim in other situations even after i wrote that poem of course i have i'm not gonna lie to you but the thing is i have to just like keep fighting and not because i know that happy ending is not going to be handed to me scream vindication vindication this soul shall be released no bondage will prosper i am a victim no more so you brought up about japanese styles of poetry and yeah. anime why mm-hmm. the connection with japan well, I will admit, I used to be a hardcore otaku when I was in high school, and I recently got back into anime a few years ago, and I do review some of that stuff. But um, it was kind of funny, because I thought when I was a teenager, now granted, I wasn't like nowhere near as mature as what I am now. But I like, just like, oh my gosh, these Japanese like, cartoons are so cool and stuff. And some of them I'll still watch to this day. Some of my favorite series are um, Hibane Reme, Technolize. I'm, yeah, I'm a huge Yoshitoshi Abe fan, I'm not going to lie about that. Uh, Hikaru no Go, like, I used to have, like, all the manga of that, so that was really cool. And i also been getting to some other things, too, but also in high school, I took community college classes in Japanese, so, and I used to be, like, semi-fluent in that. It's not so much now. But, of course, I still remember some things, like, Hajime mashite watashi wa kartes desu, dozo yoroshiku onigashimasu, meaning, hello, my name is Curtis, nice to meet you in that language. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, then, I've proposed a whole new outlet for your creative talent. Why don't you go J pop? <laughs> oh my goodness, I do like some J pop. <laughs> I just, I gotta be honest with you right there, but um, I don't know if I could ever go in that way. But I think I might reference like some anime things like down the road though. But even like in some like Kata Udo videos, like I would wear some of the things. Like I remember wearing a um, a Habne Reme shirt once. Um, I even showed a Battle Royale shirt, a.k.a. the original Hunger Games. Um, <laughs> and obviously I wore my uh, Kimba the White Lion hat like a, a couple times, though. So that was just kind of fun to explain it, especially to Disney fans. Right? And they're like, wait, you mean Simba? I'm like, no, I'm talking about Kimba. And he's been around decades before the Lion King. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Don't even get me started on that like argument. Like, I will go off on that. <laughs> But um, but the thing is, I do, even though I will admit I was a bit, a lot of a Japanophile, like, like looking at some of the poetic forms, which still inspire me, and some of the anime and live action stuff, but I enjoy films from, like, all different countries, because with Iridium, I've reviewed stuff from um, 
from England, also like American independent films. I reviewed a couple of stuff from Argentina, uh, Ecuador, which is the only other country I've been to besides um, America, by the way. Um, I've even reviewed a few Canadian films, too. Well, I know I've really been into some of the Korean films, too. Nice, yeah. I've, I've seen some Korean stuff, not as much as the Japanese stuff, obviously, but I've seen a few. I recently saw a documentary a few weeks ago, it, and it was filmed directly in South Korea. It was called um, My Love, Don't Cross That River. It's about um, this elderly couple well, that was actually filmed in um, was in the same province where Pyeongchang is, where they just had the Winter Olympics. You are a constellation guiding and enlightening when my universe lay bleak. As I approached the event horizon that resembled my worst weeks, the planets themselves violently laughed as I was clothed in wormholes, eating away at my frame or my place in time. Please, save me again. Please, save me again. Please, save me again. The obvious question's got to come. What's next for Ospreyshire? I'm really glad you asked that. <laughs> Okay, I, I just feel like it's kind of funny. Before I give you my answer, I m- made a little uh, statement yesterday on uh, the Osprey Shire blog saying that I wasn't going to say what I'm just going to do next. And I guess this will kind of be my little secret to the world, if you will, of what I'm going to do next. Kind of to strengthen my discography, if you can see where I'm going with this. Mm -hmm. I am actually going to give myself an imposed challenge to write an album. But I want it to be different from the stuff I have been putting on the compilations and also with Versus Versus Anhedonia EP. (laughs) I want to try to see how many songs I can record in a span of one day, whenever I have a day off, obviously. But I want to use some more uh, organic instrumentation mixed in with some of the acousmatics, so kind of like an acousmatic acoustic album. I'm still coming up with a lyrical concept to match everything, but um, that is going to be my next goal as Osprey Shire, outside of my other creative pursuits. (laughs) I hope you enjoy that. That does sound like a challenge. Yes, it does. I mean, I do enjoy giving myself uh, creative challenges. Like, part of me is kind of used to it, whether it's like doing music or even doing NaNoWriMo like for the past few years for my uh, writing projects. <laughs> Curtis, thanks so much for coming on the antidote. It's been great finally having a chance to have a talk. Yes, likewise. I'm glad you were able to give me this interview and wanting to have a conversation with me. I, I really appreciate that. Wake, rise, look at those heights. Each story can be yours. Start acting so you can rise up to kiss exospheres. Mountains will envy the progress you've made as you've shown the world the many stories of success. Putting doubt to flight by each flight of stairs. Reaching to the heavens, the mockers will be at your feet. They can't hope to ascend the base. Why let the sky be the limit? Grasp those galaxies if you can. Horizons will pave the pathways. I didn't want to break the flow of my visit with Osprey Shire's Curtis Bell, so I saved the song titles from this playlist till now. We began with Emancipating Spark and moved to Carapace, My Heart is a Crater, Gilded Lives, Servile Fear, Theophobia, Osteopathic Mutation, You Are a Constellation, and we finished with In the Embrace of Stratospheric Achievements. As I said earlier, Ospreyshire is a brilliant and brief artist. Someone else who's also stretching music boundaries is Zach Bradier of Captive Portal. Enjoy this. Zach Bradier is Captive Portal, and he's here to speak with The Antidote. 
Thanks for coming, Zach. Thank you for having me, man. It's awesome to be here. I'm going to tell you this right from the start. You are a music troublemaker, Zach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that totally makes sense. Because you do such a wild range of music. I mean, nobody told you that this isn't the way that you're supposed to make music? No, I just kind of I get stuff in my head, and for better or for worse, I put it in music form. And if people like it, that's a surprise. If people hate it, that's to be expected. So, <laughs> <laughs> You even tell about that on the band Facebook page. It says that Captive Portal is musical madness. I mean, so yes. <laughs> when did the insanity begin? Um, the Captive Portal music project, the actual start date from what I remember was Thanksgiving 2012. Um, that's where I made my first song as that project called Jesse's Wisdom Tooth. And I just took one day before the Thanksgiving gathering, I'm going to try something new that I haven't done before. All the stuff I've done in the past, I wasn't really a fan of, and I just wanted to start from square one. So I just wrote that song in a day, and the rest is history, I guess. I suppose if I was asked, I would have to say that Captive Portal is primarily experimental EDM. But you did change that around on your 2017 EP, Music is Telephone. It's sort yes. of shoegaze acoustic guitar. Mm -hmm. What is it? You just don't want to have a certain focus for your music? Um, not necessarily. I I always want to try using different instruments, trying different styles of music to see what I can pull off. And there's stuff going on in my head all the time of what sounds I want to try to replicate or what style of music, what time signature, what length, uh, what feel. And I just start making songs, and if it turns out somewhat listenable, I finish it, and then I put it out for free. Does this mean that you're a music sponge? You know, you hear something, <laughs> and you want to do your own creation? Uh, I guess you can say that, because my music collection is pretty huge, I would say. Probably bigger than the normal person at my age in his mid-20s. I would say maybe 3,000 CDs I've gotten over the course of time, a decent amount of records, cassettes, I even have a couple hard drive releases, floppy disk releases. I don't know, I just am very intrigued to very obscure ways of creating certain sounds or even doing styles of music with different types of instruments. Um, one artist that I've listened to growing up, his name is Goto80 from Sweden. He is very eclectic with his music styles. He has done like pop, jazz, experimental, some funky stuff, disco stuff, some drum and bass too. But he all does it on the Commodore 64. <laughs> then like he branches off with like older pieces of gear. So just things like that just pretty much intrigue me. I guess I can do something weird like that too. I don't know. Not necessarily that I want to like copy other people, but I hear different styles of music, different sounds like oh, this guy created this instrument from a circuit bent toy or he took a walk in the woods or something, went to the city, brought a microphone with him and recorded stuff and used that for a part of a song or a short film. What I like to do is take little bits and pieces of that. I like to make drum beats out of sounds I record just from going about in the world, just like walking in the city or this driving by and I hear like this car and this makes a weird sound and I'm like oh I have my microphone with me I'm gonna pull it out record it and maybe a couple of years I go back to all the sounds I've recorded hey this may be a cool hi-hat sound or a snare sound so even though I'm a drummer I guess I just hear rhythms and beats and loops and stuff just from out in the world and I'm like I almost want to make a song from that recreate it or record its source, you know? I like seeing wildlife, but this would be way too close for me. Here comes Shaking Hands with a Polar Bear from Captive Portal. <laughs>
what I guess I can't understand is why you would want to create music this way. I'd think that having a specific style would make your job a heck of a lot easier. I agree with you. So then why not just do typical music? I guess for me, not making typical music myself, I guess I just could get bored of it. I I like to take on challenges, I guess. Like, for example, you mentioned music is telephone. I'm more of a drummer, not really a guitar player, and I've dabbled in it, but not really acoustic guitar. So with that EP, I was just thinking, could I make five songs in a month using solely that one instrument? So I got the idea of doing like an acoustic looping kind of thing, even though I don't own that gear. So I grabbed the camera, grabbed the guitar, mic'd everything up, and for one whole day I recorded loops for a total of five songs. And then over the course of that month, I pieced it together to what the release is today. And also I had videos on YouTube accompanying it, showing me actually playing it and the video blocks repeat themselves to where it's like an acoustic looping video, but I looped it on Pro Tools, so I kind of cheated because I can't do it live. (laughs) That's an incredible amount of work. Your wife Mm -hmm. must want to kill you. She's never going to see you. You're constantly going to be recording. (laughs) Yeah, uh, there there are some times where I'm just like so hyper-focused and I have to work, and my wife's like, hey, I exist too. You should come spend time with me. I'm like, I should probably do that, so... (laughs) I love my wife, though. She puts up with me a lot. No one I know personally really understands the music that I make, like my whole entire catalog. Some may get certain releases or certain styles that I've done, but the catalog as a whole, they're like, this guy's crazy. (laughs) Okay, so we've determined that your music is random, and so are your song titles. Yeah. I'm going to put out a couple here. Pushing a cart or wearing a jacket breadcrumb trees, equestrian encryption. I mean, how do you dream these up? Uh, Various different ways, actually. Let me just preface by saying, on my phone, I have a list of song titles that I thought of or have come up in situations over the years. Like pushing a cart or wearing a jacket, uh, me and a couple friends a few years ago went to a Target just to like look around, just to hang out. And one of my friends, even though he wasn't going to buy anything, he was walking around with the cart and he threw his jacket in there. And I'm like, why do you want to have a cart for just a jacket? It's like, I either wear this jacket or I'm going to push a cart. I'm like, pushing a cart or wearing a jacket. Okay, possible song title. So I wrote it down so I didn't forget it. (laughs) And so when I'm finished with the song or getting near finished with the song, I go through the list thinking what ridiculous phrase that I thought of or someone else has thought of would fit with this song, so pushing a cart or wearing a jacket is that. That's so funny. I don't know if you've had those when you're like talking with someone and someone like slips on words or you think they said something, but they said something different and what you thought they said was really hilarious. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, so I try to write down most of those as I possibly can because it's something that just like you forget in an instant. So I want to remember all the weird set of words that were put together. Because me personally, I'm not the best with words and making song titles is really, really difficult for me. So these phrases are just like random sets of words fits with the randomness and musical madness that is me. This is Zach Berdier of Captive Portal and you've got the antidote where Christian music doesn't suck.
There's a lot more to the music of Captive Portal than just odd song titles like Pushing a Cart or Wearing a Jacket. Here's more from Zach and the song Be Which One. Let's go to another switch in genre for Captive Portal. Your latest release, What Is, goes post-rock, sort of dream wave. I mean, the sound is so smooth, you feel as if you're floating on air listening to it. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. So this was around the same time that I made the Music Is Telephone release. Around uh, the fall of 2016, I wanted to see if I could make a set of five songs with just completely different styles I haven't done before. And the Music Is Telephone one came out first, which is the acoustic looping EP of sorts. And then I've always wanted to try a full release of shoegaze music, echoey guitar, see if I can make a whole EP with live drums, bass, and guitar, and maybe like a voice here and there. So I took a month to create the What Is EP in November of 2016, I believe, but I guess since I just got focused on so many other projects and the net label I was trying to put it out at the time is super busy and I didn't have everything ready for release so that's why it took so long for it to come out and it only came out in March of this year. Well that's certainly an unusual way of releasing music. Mm -hmm. You also take it another way because you're putting out your own music and other bands releases on cassette. I remember the days when CDs first came onto the market Everybody tossed out their tapes. Now they're Mm -hmm. back. But are cassettes really just a novelty? I have no idea, but (laughs) (laughs) the the whole cassette thing is very interesting to me because a few years ago, when I saw that bands were putting out cassettes again, I thought, this is not going to last. This is the strangest thing. I've given up on cassettes for a long time. But... I've noticed that bands started to do it again. Some people just like to have it because, I mean, I actually, I'm holding a cassette right now. It's really cool to hold and look at, and you can do all like the weird colors and see through, not see through kind of things. And I guess packaging-wise, it's a pretty cool-looking thing. The whole cassette thing is very strange, but then again, I have albums from people that release stuff on floppy disk.
cassettes might have been old school and now they're back. Is that the same situation with 8-bit music? You went that route on the single. 100841? How do you say it? I've actually never said it out loud, to be honest. <laughs> so you don't um, even know. <laughs> you can say whatever you want to say. It. Um, Yeah, I did that chiptune actually with my old Game Boy Color that I have. I also have an EP called Laughing Turkeys, which I try to do strictly chiptune just to see if I could do it. And I think it came out okay, I guess. We'll see. Um, yeah, the chiptune thing... Uh, going back also with like artists like Go280, I also like Bit Shifter and Null Sleep, which those two artists run 8 bit peoples. Um, it's like basically using the Game Boy or using the Nintendo Entertainment System or Commodore 64, Famicom, or whatever game system was used back in the day and use it as an instrument, you know? Because even some bands today use those sounds but not necessarily make chip tune music like they have a synth that has that sound and i guess they want to see if they can create songs using those pieces of gear only and there's yeah there is some nostalgia to it because a lot of those artists grew up with those game systems and those sounds so even though i didn't really fully grow up with those sounds i was always intrigued by it and also with the circuit bending and experimenting there's so many different ways that people try to create chiptune music with the limited gear that they have. They have pedal boards, they create their own instruments with it. It's, it's all very interesting stuff to me. The chiptune track 100841 by Captive Portal. Well, I've had a busy week with several artists meeting with me for interviews. You heard Zach speak about the punk band Two Minute Minor. I spoke with their frontman, Wiley Willis, about their upcoming album, Blood on Our Front Stoop. And The Antidote will premiere that album and the interview on May 9th. I also spoke with Sacramento hip-hop artist Million just this afternoon, and you'll be hearing that next week. I know that tonight's music styles might be a bit of a stretch for some listeners, but I always like to bring a wide range of music art to the antidote. Osprey Shire and Captive Portal certainly fit that artistic title. If you're looking for more, they both have their music up on Bandcamp. Okay, this is it. The last of my talk was Zach from Captive Portal. Earlier on, he spoke about drums being his main instrument. And what could be more appropriate than having our final song be Drums for Jobs? See you next week.
you were talking about all the styles of music that you brought into your sound as Captive Portal, but that isn't your only music outlet. You're also tied into a couple of punk bands. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the two bands I'm currently in are October Bird of Death and Two Minute Minor. I've always enjoyed being in bands as well because I like to play music with other people and drums is my main instrument and will always be. Growing up, I was also intrigued by mainly 90s pop punk. Um, I was also in other bands throughout high school and college, more so on the punk edge or pop punk edge. What's the attraction with punk versus what you're doing with Captive Portal? Good question. Uh, one of the band interviews for Two Minute Minor and October Bird of Death, uh, there was a speed round where they asked, like, what's the band or artist that got you into playing punk? And for me, that's MXPX, punk rock show. I mean, come on, that's such a classic. <laughs> um, Yuri, holy crap, that guy can play. And the fact that he can still do that today without breaking a sweat blows my mind. And I guess as a kid... Yuri, the drummer, and also the drummer of P.O.D., those two drummers have always inspired me to play drums in those styles, but I kind of went more in the punk route because I've always wanted to see how fast I can play, how fast my hands can play. And that's what you're able to do. I guess so, but I still don't think I'm as far as good as Yuri is. That guy's a machine. <laughs> he really is, and he looks like he's the manager of a McDonald's look wise that's insane that's hilarious actually i'm trying to imagine him in that outfit right now you go yuri <laughs> <laughs> if you could do anything you wanted to with music what would it be hmm. it would be awesome if i would be able to pull off creating every style of music that is out there but I know that is impossible because I'm one person and I'm also limited in my skill. I'm sure I can never play black metal or death metal anything ever. So that's one style of music I can't do. So You have to tell us what's next on your list to record, Zach. Like, are you going to surprise people again? I do have some stuff in the works. I mean, I'm always creating songs regardless if it's Captive Portal or some other project I'm doing. So whenever I get a good collection of songs that seems to be like a good release, I'll put it out through a net label most likely, and we'll see how many I put out this year or next year or the future. And we'll be looking forward to that. Listen, Zach, thanks so much for coming on The Antidote and talking about Captive Portal. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it a lot.